Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Contractor Evolution Show. This is your host, Benji. One facet of our businesses that will undoubtedly look wildly different in 10 years is in-home selling. Now, historically speaking, our sales process has for the most part remained the same. A lead comes in, that lead gets called until they answer, at which point we build some rapport, ask some qualifying questions and schedule an estimated appointment, a consultation, a design meeting, whatever you call it in your business. Then that day arrives, we drive to the residence or business, we look at the job, we do our spiel, hopefully we close the deal. Tricky customers or larger projects may need a few follow-ups, but if you've got decent communication skills, a good reputation and aren't a total weirdo, you're going to land between 35 and 55% of these. Take a deposit, book them into the schedule. You get the gist of it. In-home selling has worked for us and I'm not here to knock it necessarily. But if you take a step back and put it in the context of our modern business environment, this way of going about it leaves a few things to be desired. For one, there's actually very little time spent selling. There's the drive there, the drive back, the time spent measuring or building a scope. And don't forget about the four outbound calls you had to make to reach this lead in the first place. Rising costs and fuel make this format increasingly burdensome too. And then there are changing buyer preferences to consider. Yeah, baby boomers may welcome us over for a coffee and a two hour chit chat in the backyard, but are millennials looking for that level of personal touch when they need work done? My personal take, in-home selling is ripe for disruption and is about to evolve in ways that will blow your mind. Brad Baker and Devin Crowell of Artisan Roofing just happen to be at the forefront of this progression. Using marketing automations, clever email nurtures, Eagle View reports, and a VA in the Philippines, they drove, get this, $6.6 million in sales out of one salesperson. Also get this, in one of the worst markets, economically speaking, in the country. Oh, and the kicker, zero time lost in the car driving from appointment to appointment. This conversation highlights the story of a roofing company, but the overall thought process and implementation will have parallels and learnings for any kind of contractor. The lingo might be different, the tools might vary, but mark my words, this is the way it's going for all of us, no matter your industry niche. So to hear how these two are pioneering a brand new way of selling, stay tuned. You're watching Contractor Evolution, where we unpack the systems, tactics, and skills you need to take your fast-growing contracting business to the next level. You're here to learn what it takes to scale up, work less, and increase profitability. You've come to the right place. Stay tuned to learn what separates the new breed of contractor from the old school, and welcome to your ultimate guide on the business of contracting. Brad and Devin, how are you guys? It's so good to see you again. Fantastic. Thanks for inviting us on. Yeah, great, man. Thank you. Uh, it was really fun seeing you last week. For the listeners, we just got back from our annual Winter Summit, Breakthrough Academy's Winter Summit, which was uh, like really a high watermark, I think, for us as a, as a company and a group and a really nice way to start the year. Uh, the gist of it, and if you haven't checked out our, our socials, go check it out. It's at BT Academy on Instagram kind of see some photography and some imagery of the event, but it's, it's a, it's a few hundred entrepreneurs that kind of get together, uh, all in construction and trades. We mastermind, we do a full day of strategic planning where people kind of architect their year and get feedback from other entrepreneurs on what's going to work and what isn't going to work. We had some keynotes, we had some panels and then a lot of really, really good times. Um, and it was really great to log some hours with you two and kind of get ready for this conversation. Give us uh, from, from each of you, just give us a quick highlight of the event. What, what, what was, what was special about it for you two? I mean, for me, it was just that ability to kind of just zone in and just workshop the business without any outside distractions. Um, you know, we had met great contractors, very high level quality contractors there, which have amazing feedback and really allowed us to look at our business through a different lens. Mm -hmm. For sure. I, I would say the universal positivity, it was such a, mm. a large group of people to, to really get that many people together and, and have such a positive outlook and everyone working towards the same goal, very open-minded, sharing fearlessly, not afraid to speak what's on their mind, all, all the great things you're looking for. And it's just the, the value uh, takeaway was amazing for us. We actually came to some great conclusions on mm -hmm. some new, new directional pieces for the business, but uh, that, that really came from just opening up and, and sharing our books and having people really give uh, open and honest criti criticism back and uh, share fearlessly. It was a lot of hugs and a lot of high fives <laughs> and a lot of good vibes. Absolutely. And uh, you guys both said it well. I, 
you know, we'll, we'll kind of get into some of the moves you guys are making, but the reason I, I wanted to have you guys on is, um, you, know, you guys spoke at this event, uh, about your guys is like, you know, what I, what I would consider a very modern, a very advanced sales process that you guys have built using automations, using Eagle views, using a VA. Um, and so it was so much that I was like, Hey, you guys should go talk to the roofers at this event. And then I was like, let's just get them on the pod. So, so we're going to get into this system and you guys are going to take us through the ins and outs, but I actually just want to start with a bit of a breakdown and some numbers. Tell us about the results that you guys are able to drive. I believe with one salesperson in the market that you're in, which is Moncton. Yeah. Well, first we can touch base on our actual market. So I know a lot of people listening to this podcast might not know where Moncton is or what is a Moncton. Uh, so Moncton, New Brunswick in Canada, we're in Eastern Canada, um, we have 116,000 people uh, in our city and surrounding areas. Um, you know, the average income here is 38 grand individually. So, like, that's you know, we're about 21,000 below the national average, which is like about 59,000 right now. Um, you know, the average home price is 340,000. Uh, again, about half of the national average out of 740,000. Right. Um, so, with that market, uh, this year we did about 6.6 .6 million. Um, in both residential and commercial sa roofing sales. Uh, and we did that with one salesperson. Okay. So let me just recap that 6.6 .6 million out of one salesperson, which would be remarkable in a metropolitan center in a city <laughs> yeah. like Toronto or Dallas or Vancouver. Uh, and what we're saying is you guys, and I know this is like your guys' hometown, so I'm not going to knock it, but I'm just saying like, just numbers wise, like this isn't exactly what you would call a strong market compared to other no, parts of North America. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And Moncton's kind of one of those places that uh, if you have heard of it, it was probably on your drive through to go to Nova Scotia or to other places. It was uh, somewhere you drove through, but never really stopped in. Uh, yeah. But it's, uh, it's, it's a great area that's, that is growing. A lot of people are now realizing uh, what there is to offer here as far as the, the, the cost of living and some different things, which is mm. bringing a new market to us every day. So we've had some exponential growth that's been the greatest since, what, 1750, I think it was, Brad? Yeah, uh, there's the, the, the increase in population <laughs> and new people coming to the province. So we're, we're putting ourselves on the map and we're going to put artists on the map as far as roofing goes. Um, when you... So we, uh, we just kind of provided those really great stats, 6.6 .6 million, one salesperson and not necessarily the best market. Uh, that reminds me of this saying, necessity is the mother of invention. Was this process or this way that you guys do things a result of just like the circumstances that you have to contend with in Moncton? There was a lot of that. I mean, basically what happened is that at the very beginning, it was just myself in the office. And, you know, I was trying to put this company together doing, you know, 15 plus hats at once. Uh, and I was just trying to figure out how I could turn myself into, you know, 10 people. Right. And I, we did that by integrating technology into our processes. Um, so being able to do that really helped amplify what I was capable of. From there, it was about handing off to another salesperson. Mm -hmm. But mo most people, most roofing businesses traditionally would, uh, you know, have enough lead flow that they can support a salesperson. So they hire mm. a salesperson, then they maybe invest more in their marketing. They get more lead flow. They bring on another salesperson. It's a very sort of like linear one step at a time, like add people to the t add, build out the roster type f uh, approach to growth. Yours is kind of inverse where it's just like we're going to come we're going to absolutely max out the like the revenue we can drive out of one person using tech using a VA mm. these are the things we're going to get into. Was that just like was that just like a was that just like naturally came from you you kind of like like stumbled into it or was there some like divine inspiration that you had as to why you did it this way? Um, well, I think when I first started, I mean, it was just something that I stumbled into. But then once I started working with Devin, uh, we started being able to bounce off each other. Like Devin is the tech guy. Um, I'm just more of the idea man here. Uh, but he was able to really help me make these ideas a reality. And once I seen it be able to be a cohesive piece of technology, it just blew my mind. And then the results were insane. Yeah. Yeah. The, the overall system is, is not that we reinvented the wheel on it. It's, yeah. it's just about taking that outside look and how can you apply some of the systems that are going on in front of us every day in other industries and how do we apply it to the contracting home service based industry and I guess asking the question why not it's it's not a matter of uh, oh we're, we're only going to do it this one because we think it's best because I think that's what a lot of people are doing they're doing it the way they've always done it because well that's the way we do it uh, versus 
let's try something new uh, and yeah. be open to that new and let's see if we can apply some of this technology to our favor and and squeeze a little more out of uh, the system in a way of having your high level people doing high level things yeah. and eliminating some of the busy work. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what you just said there about like pulling ideas from other spaces or other sectors really rings true. I um, had a really blessed to have had a few people on the show like like Ben Hodson is the CEO and founder of Job Nimbus a really big CRM. Mm-hmm. We also had Pierce Dormeyer who's I've forgotten his role but what one of the leaders at Eagle View. We're going to talk about them a little bit today. And I asked both of them the same question on different episodes like what what facet of the construction and trades like m- what facet of contracting businesses broadly speaking is the most ripe for disruption especially when you consider technology. And both of them like clear as day were like sales. Like this sort of like drive to house, meet with customer, walk around house, go inside, show the brochure, have a coffee, try to close the deal. Um, There's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's, I've, Lord knows I've sold many, 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 many jobs that way, but their take on it was like, if you look at the way other parts of businesses are being influenced in other sectors, this is sort of next on the chopping block. It's just, it's inefficient. There's windshield time. There's gas that gets burnt. It's not necessarily in line with consumer preferences. And so I think you guys are really at the, you know, we talked about this offline. You're at the forefront of a movement that I think is going to happen over the next 10 years. You guys are just very, very early adopters of it. So let, let's actually like, that's probably a good segue. Let's dive into how you guys have designed this. And in no, do you guys just kind of break this down? You talked about it last week at Summit. Just kind of break down how you guys have set this up, where the lead flows into, how it's dealt with from there. And I'm just going to pepper you with follow up questions as we go through it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so essentially, all leads are going to come through our web form. Um, whether it's from online, they hear us on the radio, or they call in, we're going to direct them right to the website. And from there, our website has qualifying questions uh, before they submit their estimate or their request for estimate. Once that comes in, they're going to get that's the kind of the, the first initial automated email, and that's a pretty traditional one. We've got your information. Thanks for you know asking. Uh, from there, this is where we kind of switched it up. Our, our VA then qualifies this lead internally for us without the salesperson having to get involved. Um, so she's going to ask qualifying questions like, you know, are you looking to get the whole roof done? When do you want this project to be completed by? Are there any outside parties involved? Um, stuff like that. Uh, once that's determined, then she goes ahead and processes the request for an Eagle View report. Uh, once that Eagle View report then comes in, we have various templates that we've very detailed and built out for all the different products that we install. This includes work scope and everything is line itemized. I mean, right down to a box of staples. Mm. Um, once that's done, they, she can then import the Eagle View measurements inside the template. And then from there, we've trained her how to view certain things on that Eagle View. She's looking for skylights, chimneys, flashings, um, you know, if there's like overhead lines, stuff like that. She's going to be looking for these key indicators can i ask you a couple of things i've got yeah. questions like the list is already piling up where where yeah. like so you guys do you have a fairly omni-channel approach when it comes to lead generation you mentioned they all get driven to the website i'm assuming to do a form fill but what mm-hmm. are the maybe top three or top five like sources is it paid ads is it referrals is it like what are your leads? we channels? are heavily organic we rank number one on google for our, our area for our niche uh that that, that drives it but uh, it's the brand presence that we build. A lot of our marketing is not built around your traditional sales model either. It's about uh, informative, educating the customer on the products, who we are, our credentials, what we bring to the table, and just the brand brand presence in the city on billboards and radio. We, we kind of own the radio space. I think there's a couple of radios uh, that, that we're on that we're the only roofing yeah. company on the oh, radio. Exclusively, yeah. Yeah. So these are these are these are really our inbound leads. They've found yeah. you or heard about you somewhere, either through Google, on the radio, on a billboard, whatever. And there's enough interest that they want to engage with you. So they they I'm sure all your CTAs on all your ads basically push to the website, one centralized place. They go yeah. through that capture and then now it's in VA world. And I kind of interrupted you there, but now the VA picks that lead up and is going through some qualifying and moving them along the chain, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's honestly, I'm, I come from a marketing background as well, and it's a bit of an anomaly. It's uh, there's so much <laughs> bandwidth that we have that we could turn the volume up on actual digital marketing that it's almost scary if, if we actually were to dip into that where we could go. And I'll, 
obviously that, that model is not going to apply to everyone. We're, we're lucky to be in an area where we do have the brand authority. Uh, but I would just kind of replace and complement that with more digital marketing for someone else if they want to apply this, this model, the sales model. Yeah. But I think the point you're making is like, it's, it's, it's because it's been well designed and it's very, the funnel is very clean. It is sort of just a numbers game at this point. You could, yeah. you could just double your ad spend and double your lead flow. Like it, it's very exactly. much like having, when you get to this stage and I know because we've, you know, for the last six years been on this journey with, with what we do, it's like what you want to have is a knob that you can just turn where it's like exactly. dollars in customers out. And you guys have created that. So anyway, that's really, really interesting. This is more about the sales process. So let's get back to it. I think I cut you off, Brad, when you're talking about she's, she's qualified, the quality qualified leads get a get an eagle view is mm -hmm. that the case does every every lead that kind of hits a certain bit of criteria get sent a, an eagle view automatically yeah, exactly everything that we do is from eagle view remote remote based uh you know we very rarely do we have to go outside uh to do a, a measurement uh if we do we actually use hover which is another digital asset that we use um, and, and sometimes we'll even get the customer actually to go out, do the 360 pictures again, just get keeping us inside the office and just high efficiency, right? For our listeners that maybe don't know what Eagle view or hover is, do you want to maybe just give a really quick breakdown of, of that bit of tech? Yeah, it's pretty cool. So, so, so they both kind of just with Eagle view, it's a, it's all aerial imaging that they use. It's all proprietary imaging. Uh, so what they do is with these photo, uh, rooftop photos, they're going to break it down and they're going to give you all of the details, your pitches, your, your square footages, all your linear measurements, valleys, rakes, eaves, all are going to be detailed on that for you. And they break them all down uh, at the very bottom too. And you get all these great pictures, you get the co-branded. So again, it just helps build that brand trust with the customer. With Hover, it's actually using photographs taken from your from your phone. Mm -hmm. uh, and it tells you where to take pictures around the building. And then it's gonna generate a whole same same idea, a digital takeoff um, of this of the project. And I mean you you're down to an inch in terms of accuracy. But the 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 net uh, benefit is that like uh, there's no there's absolutely zero need to go out to site to measure things or look at yeah. things. It's all a digital report that gets sent to you to a level a level of accuracy you're not even going to be able to do with a tape measure and a ladder. And so point being that removes a huge amount of trips to huge. go and gather this stuff. And that's yeah. why a VA is able to do it from wherever she operates uh, or he mm -hmm. operates. Um, what was I going to ask? Oh, so, uh, you know, a lot of people go, and I've heard this at conferences, like, oh, like Eagle Views are so expensive. It's, I don't know, 60 <laughs> bucks a pop or 80 bucks a pop. You guys have obviously done the, done the math on this where it's like we can afford to send these out very liberally because we convert them efficiently. So maybe just talk a, a little bit about how you guys calculated that. Yeah, I mean, really, when you break it down, it doesn't take very long to see the cost benefit. Uh, if you look at the average Eagle View, which is actually like between like twenty five and forty dollars for residential, um, you take the time to get in the truck, drive to location, set up your ladder, go measure the roof, and then maybe potentially get caught in some left field conversation with the customer. Then you know by the time you get back to the office, you spent you know three four hours potentially off you know off site not doing anything, and you haven't even got the estimate done at this point. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So when you really break it down, it, it really doesn't take long to see the cost benefit. Well, if you're, if you're talking a high level person, you're not sending out one of your, your low level laborers to do these measurements or to, to take uh, that time with the customer either. So if you actually mm -hmm. average out what you're paying your top level people to be offsite, to not even actually be working on the sale portion yet, because mm -hmm. it, realistically, your, your customer is not going to be interested until they see that price. So a lot of that is just preliminary wasted time that could be done in a, in a more efficient way. Yeah. And it's something to be said that it's this whole process that allows us to do a high volume of estimates every month. Like, for example, if you look at the average uh, salesperson that's doing it in a traditional manner, they're usually doing two leads a, a, a day. So two leads a day translates into 10 leads a week, translates into 40 leads a month. Right. So where our, as our, our salesperson right now is currently averaging in the peak seasons between 150 to 200. So right there, we have three to four X to the output. Right. So, okay. Going back to this process though, uh, an Eagle view mm -hmm. gets, gets pulled. You guys build that into a beautiful, like client facing proposal, by the way, uh, for those of you listening, uh, on audio and you want to have like a, you want to have the visual aspect of this, I'm going to include, 
they put to, Brad and Devin put together some really great slides with some nice infographics, and it just kind of lays out how all of this flows. We're we're going to talk about this as concretely and and as with as much detail as we can. But if you're a visual person, you just want to see the whole thing laid out in front of you. Go to the link in the description and download that and check it out. Um, so okay. I digress. It gets Eagle View gets pulled. Uh, beautiful client facing proposal gets sent. Talk, talk a little bit about like the nurture sequence or what kind of happens there from from there on. Yeah, absolutely. So once the proposal's built, uh, this it's it's mindful to say that also like at this point the salesperson will do a quick vet of that estimate before it sends out to the customer, and this is just us doing our due diligence, making sure that nothing gets missed. But that's the first time that the salesperson actually has to really get involved and look at this and he gets familiarized with the contract. Then it gets sent out to the customer. Once it's sent out to the customer, uh, we do have a 30 day uh, sequence that we put in place. Uh, so the first day we send out, uh, the day after receiving the proposal, we'll send out a list of our credentials and kind of like, this is why you're choosing us. Um, you know, our master elite certifications, all of our installation certifications, uh, any industry awards that we have, um, we put that all out there. Uh, and again, that's just building the trust with the customer. Mm -hmm. uh, from there, two days later, the customer is gonna, we're gonna do a, a follow-up and it's a Q&A following up. Do you have any questions? If, do you need any help making your decision? Uh, and then after that, we're gonna go into, and this is actually one of my highest converting emails. It's 10 questions to ask your roofing contractors. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we send out this really beautiful email that goes out with a list of questions and of course, our answers underneath them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably by far, probably 40% uh, conversion on that email alone. Why, why does that email, why is that the one that really kind of captures attention and gets people to click? Is it transparency, honesty? Like, have you thought about what it is the customer likes about that specific message? Yeah, I, I would say that that's, it really comes down to just removing the ego from it. And it's, it, if, even if you're not choosing us, we want mm -hmm. you to be informed on, the product, uh, what else is out there in the market, what other guys are potentially promising that they're not actually going to be able to live up to. Uh, we have a 25 year warranty. Oh, that sounds great, but it's only a manufacturer's defect warranty. It's not actually going to cover if you get a leak or if they installed it improperly. There's a lot of things in there within that email that go beyond, okay, even if you're not going to choose us, we want you to be informed as a customer about the product, about the industry and the caveats of dealing with the, the chuck in the truck, I guess, if you will, and the, the false promises that are being made. So mm. it's, it's, it's not really a sales pushy uh, oriented. It's, it's really just about, hey, we, we want to protect you and educate you as well, even if you don't go with us. And you've noticed like like in the data, and I think you guys are using AccuLinks or it mm -hmm. doesn't matter, whatever you're using to uh, for, for marketing automations, you're checking the the click through rates or the conversion rates of the emails and this specific one converts the best out of a long chain of emails. Yeah, no, hundred percent. And that actually was born from when I used to do in person sales. One of the things I used to say to the customer was, "Hey, even if you don't choose us, you should be looking out for these questions." Yeah, right. And yeah. it's the same ones that I put in my email. It right? never it never hurts to kind of subtly shit talk your competition <laughs> just a little bit in a classy yeah. way. Keep yeah. it fair, keep it above board. But I, I know it's a little subtle hint to like, hey, you know, they might be cheaper, but. Um, okay, so that is email. What do you say? That's three of four? Or where, yeah. where were so, we at on the so, flow? So right now, that's going to be, so that's the third email that went out. Uh, and then next, we're following into a trigger that's at, set, at day seven after receiving their estimate. If they haven't chosen us yet, this triggers the salesperson to do a phone call follow-up. Mm -hmm. And this allows for a very personal touch point. Uh, so at this point now, they're talking to someone on the phone. Um, he can ask them to come in, make an appointment to our showroom uh, or close the deal on the phone. Uh, but it, this really helps bring in that personal aspect to the sales uh, whole process. Um, what percent of, of sales convert from the email nurture versus what percentage actually require some, some phone calls and some, some actual like hands-on sales skill from your salesperson? I mean, at this point, I would say we're about 40, 45% is an actual, like of the, of the whole scale of, of approvals. Yeah. Uh, about 40, 45% are actually just being, yes, we'd like to move forward with you. When can we book a time? Right. Um, and then, but we, with all of our people, we bring them into our showroom, uh, walk them through the whole system and, and really show them what we're going to do, how we're going to do it uh, before we sign that contract. But what I'm at, I think what I'm curious about is if you've been in sales, you know that there are hot leads, there are cold leads, there's lukewarm leads, there's everything in between. These, um, your automations, because mm -hmm. they're 
they're timed correctly, they're written well, the proposal's beautiful, the whole experience to this point has been very seamless. You're basically skimming all the freebies off the top yeah. using automation so that the salesperson at day seven is basic, all that person is doing is working on the leads that the deals that need to be worked on. He's not yeah. like he's not working on the freebies which require no effort and he's not working on like the dead tire kickers cuz those have been disqualified. His entire focus is on estimates and open deals that like require that type of skill, that type of handling, which I just think is like, I've done enough sales. Like, man, that would be so cool if your entire day was just working on that little bit of the process, but it never is. You're doing measurements, you're doing follow-ups, you're dealing with tire kickers. You're so it's it that I think that's the point I really want to highlight. It's like when you think about everything you just went through this salesperson, what's his name, by the way, Julian. Julian gets a notification on day seven saying, hey, there's some open deals here who have had an Eagle View done. They've seen a proposal. They've seen the price. They've opened these emails or they haven't. He'd be able to see all that. And here's what you need to do to basically move this along, which is just kind of like, hello, why aren't we like this? It just seems so simple when you explain it. Uh, but obviously, it's very difficult to implement. And uh, that's kind of why I wanted to, to talk to you guys about this. Um so from the, you mentioned this, the, the showroom, Di, yes. tell, tell me a little bit how that kind of intersects with this whole process. Yeah, I'll get to that. But I know that, uh, Devin, you had uh, a great analogy when we were talking before. Yeah. So salesperson. yeah, we have, we have Julie and I, I, I would consider him our high level person again, getting back to keeping high level people doing high level things. And if this was a restaurant, we have Julie and he's, he's grilling the steaks and we have the, the VA, she's peeling and cutting the potatoes. It's why, why waste your, your chef's time on potatoes? He, he's, he's, he's focusing on the meat on the grill. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a very, very good analogy. And, and I, I think that that's like, what you guys have done is is a seamless way to have people stay on leverage time versus deleverage time. Um, and so what happens from what happens from that day seven email forward? what's what's kind of the the game from there? Uh, so from day seven forward, uh, either they're going to come into the showroom uh, where he has 30 minute slots booked for that. If they're still not ready, because again, like I'm not a fan of pressured sales. I don't think people want to be sold anymore. Um, so if they're still not ready for it and they're still waiting to make a decision uh, from there, we have more uh, automated emails that are going to come out. So three days after the phone call follow up, we'll have a, a material warranty comparison chart a blog that's sent out them that they can see. From there, another good one that we have conversion ratio here is the nine essential factors to consider when choosing a roofing material. Okay. Um, and then finally, on day 30, we'll have just a fun one. It's just 10 fun roofing facts uh, to put out there. And then from there, our VA will actually put out a final email. Hey, would you like to book an appointment? Here's a link on our calendar where you can come into our office mm -hmm. uh, and see the products. Mm -hmm. So you're able to maintain that personal touch by pushing people to the show. This isn't, I'm sure, by the way, when you talk to other roofers about this, people, a lot of people are like, wow, like nobody wants to be sold by a robot or this. I'm sure there's a lot of objections around how this yeah. is like too <clears throat> cold or too mechanical. You've kind of solved that problem by having a showroom that's open and they can very easily book a time to come in and meet um, meet you guys whenever they want at any point of this process, right? Yeah, hundred percent. And the way that I, I, I talk about that is that we're not just making this like a very like systematical process, like cold operation. Like there's very like good, you know, interpersonal touch points here. And at the end of the day, before we close the deal, they always come in see our operation, touch the products. Uh, it still is a very uh, like personal feeling to the whole vibe for the customer. And, and and past the sales process, our, our project managers on site are very involved with the customer. That's that's really where that that warm hug comes in. We're just getting mm -hmm. rid of the preliminary upfront busy work of the qualification process. By the time that the, the the deal is agreed to and they've approved, that's when you're coming in. We're giving you the handshake. You're picking your materials out. So there still is a personal involvement, especially as the progress the, the project progresses through the the different stages all the way to the final end. Uh, our final touches. There's there's a lot more personal. Uh, connection that happens there and we have video reviews actually from customers saying how personal and, and warm they felt and how well that we they, they that we took care of them and educated them about the product and helped them with their choice uh i was going to ask you about that so like like from a from the clients or the prospects per perspective are 
the, you know, you're not getting calls and complaints, people being like, oh, I really, really miss, you know, the old school touch. Like people are by and large good with this process, right? Yeah, 100%. Uh, you know, we get re like reviews and, you know, comments all the time of like how well informed they felt, you know, how taken it care of they felt because we have automations even on our calendar when they get moved or anything like that. Like their communication is, is huge with mm -hmm. us. Um, and, and always being well informed, the customers love it. Uh, they're getting more information, like you know, 10x the information from us than any other contractor in this area. Um, was training a VA difficult for this? Like when you think about how much that that person actually has to do. What's their name, by the way? Sky. Sky. Uh, man or woman? Woman. Where does she live? Philippines. Okay. So Sky's she, in the she works Fili the graveyard shift for us. Sky's in the Philippines working the graveyard shift for you guys. She's doing qualifications. She's pulling eagle views. She's doing what what we would consider like sales admin, but she's doing yep. it at a higher level because you guys have equipped her really well. Um, you know, this isn't necessarily rocket science, but it's also not just like peeling onions to use your example. <laughs> like there is some like this is actually kind of a tricky job. Was it? Was it difficult to train her overseas to uh, kind of do what she needs to do to set up your salesperson for success every time? I, I would say that VAs are, are really not going to be outside the box thinkers. You're not going to get a critical thinker that's going to take judgment calls into play here. It really comes down to your SOPs and your your ability to deliver those to someone in a, in a matter that they're going to be able to respond to and a lot of what we're doing we're talking in a digital world so we're able to actually do screen recordings and share screen recordings along with text SOPs that she can follow along with step by step so step one do this but also watch the video and, and follow along with that process and click the boxes and then as, as any questions arise and uh, there's always the ability for us to jump in she just tags us on the CRM and within AccuLinks and we, we get tasked with a hey I've hit a roadblock here I need you to jump in but that that typically births another SOP because yeah. a lot of these things are, are going to be repeating things. It's just you might come across a few first times with the with, with your VA, but once you've crossed that, that, that item off, you create a new SOP around it, and now she knows how to approach that the next time. Yeah. So you need some infrastructure in place for her to follow, but once it's there, it's basically just like she's, she's checking boxes in a very reliable way. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, at the end of the day, you, you first of all, you need to have a remote application. Like your your business has to be able to be remote to, to do this. You know, you can't be doing pen and paper. Right. Um, so being remote is, is is definitely a huge aspect of it. Uh, but also having just rigid processes, like mm -hmm. having a, a really strict set of rules and answers. Uh, you know, and that way you don't you don't want at the end of the day you don't want them to be a critical thinker and making a judgment call on your business. You want them following the rules that you set in place. Totally, you're 100 percent right about that. That's um, you guys, you and your leadership team would do a lot of that critical thinking and decision making and complex problem solving. What you really need is someone to just like boom punch through tasks a lot of the time, uh, which is seemingly you know increasingly difficult to find locally. And I think that's why a lot mm. of people are doing this using VAs. Um, I'm curious if you guys have noticed. Like so, just looking at the whole, the system as a whole and some of the numbers that you know we would track. Have you noticed a dip in sales ratio going this route? Um, like I'm just like I'm just, what I'm guessing is you've probably seen a slight dip in SR, but then a huge boost in volume. So the net yeah. result is really is that is that about right? Hundred percent. Like when I was doing in person sales, I was probably closing in around 40, 45 percent. Yeah, but that sounds right. When I when I switched down to this one, we're set, we're hovering around between twenty eight and thirty percent, but we forex our output. Okay, so that's an important point because someone listening will be like, "Hi, I got you. This system sucks. <laughs> I sell, you know, I sell at forty five percent, I sell at fifty cent, fifty percent, and you sell at thirty percent, but you forex the amount of." Low that you can push through the system, and you probably haven't even capped it yet. I'm, I, I doubt nope. I mean, you could probably do a lot more oh, yeah. using the infrastructure you have. So yeah. it's it is a numbers game. This is a volume game, and if you look yeah. at, you know, a lot of lot of sales gurus will talk about this. Like like sales is an activity based thing. We can talk about tactics and better closes and better rapport building and certain ways to. Uh, get more ju juice out of every squeeze. But at the end of the day, the best salespeople do a lot, a lot of meetings. They process a mm -hmm. lot, a lot of leads. And this tech, this system has allowed you guys to do that with a bit more ease. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, th and that's that's the whole key to this whole thing is just to be able to you know, optimize the ability of a salesperson, not get rid of a salesperson. 
Yeah, it's an evolution, not a, you're not removing the salesperson from the model at all. It's just an evolution of, again, having their attention on where it really should be. Is data entry the best use of your salesperson's time? Is is, is chasing dead leads that they, they're they still trying to qualify, mm. a best use of their time? It's uh, take away all of that busy work and, and really get them just working at a high level all the time. So what is the average day of your salesperson? Like what, like what do they spend most of their time on? Like can you just maybe run us through his calendar? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, uh, typically he's going to start, you know, his mornings are just responding to emails that he has in his calendar. But then throughout the day, we have 30 minute uh, time slots that are booked out uh, for customers to come in and either, you know, close the deal or choose a color. Um, so really, we're getting a very high output out of him. 30 minute time slots. Customers come in. They have already have all the information. They're pretty much there because they're ready to sign the deal. Mm -hmm. um, so they come in. They're going to go through all the whole. He goes through the entire system from start to finish for the products and how we're going to install them. Mm -hmm. From there, he books them on the calendar, signs the deal, gets the deposit paid, and it moves on to the next customer. And it's just like kind of one after the other. So in his day, I mean, he can put out, you know, you know 10, 15 uh, customers on the board in one day. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm um, so I'm curious from a like just 30,000 foot view, like talking to you guys as business leaders, uh, not let's just kind of forget about you know his day and like the the microscopic view of this system and the details of it. I'm talking about how it fits into your entire business and strategy. What has like a much more futuristic and automated approach to selling made available for you guys strategically? Have you thought about that at all? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for us, it's what it's done is it opened our eyes and the ability to be able to parachute our system into any market that we choose. Um, so right now we're looking at various different markets to apply this system to. I mean, we can start cataloging and, and start building out leads and building out sales in a market before we even fully arrive. Right. So Absolutely. It, if you wanted to like expand into, you know, Halifax or what, are, I don't know the Eastern seaboard that well. What Halifax, are the other cities? Hal Halifax would be the bigger, the biggest one yeah. down here that we would probably go to. Yeah. Yeah, it's, that's a very, that's literally a, a you know you're, you're pressing a few buttons, changing, you're yeah. shifting some ad spend around, but you're very well set up to do that remotely. So you can basically pre-sell a new location with ease. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. The scalability, there, there's really no limit to it. And, and not saying that we're going to stay with one salesperson. Obviously, we're, we're, we don't want to overload him. I think we're, we're pretty much hitting the cap at our, at our sales level right now that we would want to impose on one person because we do still want to have that final in-person touch and, and keep our eyes on the prize. But uh, w when you're talking at a six and a half million dollar revenue on one salesperson, so we could easily, if we added a, t a second uh, salesperson, is 10 million very achievable, 12 million easily with, with the, the systems that we have in place. So if we're jumping into a market that is 10x the population that we're dealing with right now, we just have to look at what is the scalability? How many people do we think we need in place? You are still limited by your production crew. Uh, mm -hmm. So you're not going to jump in and, and do 10x the revenue first year. You still have to build up to those things, which gives you some time to, to have new people grow with the system. But ultimately, the system itself is so scalable and transferable that we're not reliant on the person. Not that we don't have great people. We love our people. We put great uh, effort into developing them, our RSP matching and health plans and all these different things that other people are not doing in our niche. But beyond that, we're not locked to the person. So if, if you lose, I don't know, Steve's my best salesman. And if I lose Steve, the whole, everything falls apart. What am I going to do without Steve? He wants to, mm. he wants to leave the company because great people leave great companies and it just happens. It doesn't have to be sure. for any other reason that they just want to move on to something else. We want to create something that's a little more foolproof that as we grow, it's not so reliant on the individual. It's reliant on the system and we can plug great people into the system and get great outcomes. It comes down to the personality and not just that he brings a history of sales background and we, we really need this guy if we want to succeed. We just need a great person that has a great personality that can talk, follow the systematic plan, and do all the way to success. Yeah. I'd also like to add with this system the, the financial relief that it gives you when entering a new, uh, new market. Um, you know, we don't have to have seven, eight salespeople to produce these results. Um, so the financial burden of having, you know, that many salespeople to produce these numbers um, plays into a huge factor when you're moving into different areas. It's a little easier on your overhead, isn't it? Huge. It's a massive Absolutely. difference. Yeah. yeah. Devin, to your point about um, 
about just like ha- having something, having a system that you can easily swap people in and out of if you need to. You don't want to. That's not the desire. And you do a lot to retain your talented people. But if you have to, you can. Um, one of the things that I've observed about a lot of roofing contractors with the you know thousands of assessments I've done over the last couple of years is they are, it's pretty common thread where you'll have an entrepreneur that is essentially like attached at the hip to some salesperson because they're so reliant on Tim's talent and Tim's network and Tim's like whatever. And you, I literally word for word, you'll hear them say this where they're like, man, if this guy left, like we are screwed. Like we are the bottom drops out because he walks away with 2.5 million in sales. And I don't know where I'd keep that up. And the other two salespeople I have don't even match this guy. So it, it really is kind of a great equalizer and, and, and puts the power back in your hand, I think as business leaders. Um, so, and then, and then to the expansion part, I think what you said, Brad, there is, is really brilliant. It just makes the it makes the gamble of a new market a little bit less risky because mm-hmm. you can pre-sell. It's just some ad spend. It's some time, but you're not making key hires. You're not opening an office yet. You may in time, mm-hmm. but you can do it. Sort of a it's a it's a lighter version of expansion, which I think is really interesting. I wanted to ask both of you guys. This is very open ended question, Devin. Maybe I'll start with you. The, I've heard this conversation come up a lot just like the traditional in-home selling model is maybe on its way out. What are your thoughts on like the changing landscape of sales for, uh, for contractors? You're at the forefront of it. You probably have some biases as a result, but what are, what's your take on this conversation? Well, I, I think from the outside looking in for those that have not tried this model, it's easy to say that it doesn't work for you, but can you really say something doesn't work for you if you haven't tried it? So my first recommendation to anyone is even if it's a, a small piece of this that you want to take away and try and apply slowly, I think a full overhaul is going to be difficult for anyone to just uh, implement overnight, but uh, start with a piece of it and see how it works for you and grow into it. But obviously with the successes we've had, uh, we're, we're, we're big um, <laughs> promoters of this type of automated system. But if you look at, uh, I'm no longer really selling to my mom. It's uh, we're, we're dealing with a different generation that's coming up. Uh, people don't like to answer their phone the way they used to before. It's uh, a, a lot of the, the whole contact us for pricing type of uh, marketing on the internet. It's, it's not working the way that it, it used to with trying to get someone on the phone and, and really pitch them on something. We're so upfront with our pricing. We're so upfront with our processes and what we're going to deliver that I think it it's, it's maybe potentially attracting a different mindset of a customer, uh, but there's a lot of that customer's mindset out there for us to dip into. And I think that uh, our, our less um, used car salesman approach to this sales model is really what's giving the customer that confidence that we're not really trying to sell them on anything that they don't want. For, for one, a roof is, is not so much a, a want, it's a need. That, mm-hmm. that, that's, let's start there. That, that's a different niche that, that maybe this uh, the sales model is not going to apply to, I don't know, shoes or hats or different things like that. But when you're talking an absolute need, our approach that gives the value and the, the upfront, uh, straight detailed estimate with all of the, the credentials that we bring and the real genuine care for the customer that we want them to be informed about not only the product, but the industry and what they're getting themselves into. Because other than a referral, we're not really dealing with a repeat customer. I, I hope we don't have to come back to your house for 25 right. years. Like if we did our job, we shouldn't be back out there. Yeah. So it's 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 not so much the, the, the whole sit down at the, the kitchen table mentality of building this real personal rapport with the customer for a, a, a once in 25 years sale other than a referral. So I, I think that uh, the successes we've seen come from just being open and honest with it, but filling in all the blanks with the technology pieces and still finishing strong with that personal yeah, touch. Yeah, yeah. This is so well said, Devin. Do you what do you think's at the root of these changing buyer preferences? Is it is it is it generational differences? Is it just technology and the time we live in? Like why have you thought about that? Just like where where kind of um, this this new way of buying has come from? Yeah, I I would say generational definitely plays into it. Technology is caught up to a mindset. 
uh, or, or potentially maybe the other way around, chicken and the egg a little bit, depending on what niche you're talking to. But uh, the technology allows us to not only just send out an email, because uh, if you go back a decade ago, really it was uh, emailing was, wow, I'm doing great email uh, responses, sure. email chains and, and automations. But the, the, the paired with the eagle view and paired with uh, the ability to have strong CRMs that have different triggers and the ability to have a team work within an ecosystem that is digital, uh, I think that's been a game changer for us to be able to actually accomplish these things that were 10 years ago, where the CRMs up to the level they are now, potentially not at a, a cohesive work environment where you're tagging each other and we're actually not letting anything fall through the cracks because the technology supports this model where it really wasn't there before. But I know even myself, I, I'm a little older than Brad, uh, potentially yourself, Benji, and uh, when I grew up, there was the one phone in the house that everyone ran to when it rang and you were fighting over each other to get to it. And uh, nowadays, if someone calls me before texting, it's like, what kind of a psychopath does that? <laughs> what, how did you not text me first? You just cold called me? And I think we're running into that. And even myself, being from the generation that uh, we're, we're really softening up the customer to allow the choice be theirs and not something that's forced from us. But the time we're having that in-person face face to face, they've really wanted that. They, they've chosen that versus us kind of going, hey, I'm showing up tomorrow at uh, 2 p.m. Are, are you okay with that? Uh, so it's, it's, it's less pushy. It's less in their face. It's allowed them to be back in the driver's seat and take control of the sale. Mm -hmm. So um, th there will always be room, I think, for that in-home selling approach, which I think having a, a hybrid model is kind of smart. Like it's always good to have that available, but it's mm -hmm. it's also really nice to provide options to the consumer. And some people want to do it all remote. Some people, you know, boomers, not for to pick sure. on them, but guys like my dad are like, no, come over. Like, we'll hang out for three Absolutely. hours. There's, I'll show you the lawn. It's like, bro. Totally. Like, there's, the there's exceptions to every rule. And, and yeah. we do go outside of the process for those customers that have a need. So we're, we're not that cold to go, no, we only do it this way. Yeah, and I yeah. think you, you have to, in business, be able to shift on the fly and, and apply different mindsets to, to your overall package. But if we can knock out 90, 95% of them using yeah. this system, it really frees up our time to even if we we have to put boots on the ground for for my mom, for example. We still have the time and our bandwidth to do that. Yeah, and, and Brad, like, do, do you want to weigh in on this sort of like the the change to the in home selling model where you think it's going? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I, I think obviously we're in the you know an information renaissance, and people want information. They don't want to be sold. You know, uh, the, the the whole way of the used car salesman pushing a, a product on you. I think that's out the window. Uh, and for us, the way that we look at it, we're not selling a customer; we're educating them. Um, so this allows us like all the information that we're sending them, we couldn't do that. Like they would take hours in a sit down consultation. Right. Um, so for us, it's all about giving that information to them in the most efficient way, the most appealing way so that they can really weigh out the cost benefits of going with us versus someone else. Because, you know, it's also something to say, too, that we're at the highest echelon of our price point in our market. Mm -hmm. We're not just out there scooping up the cheapest uh, projects that are out there. What's your average job size? Uh, right now we're at uh, 24,000. 24,000 AJS in a market whose average income is $38,000. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. And 116,000 yeah. people live there and you only have one salesperson. Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> um, I'm going to leave. We're going to, uh, guys, once again, if you want to check out the slides, I they, these are, they're beautiful. They put a lot of work into them. It really lays out this whole process really well. Um, I think that you guys are going to get a lot of traction with this and I'd love it if people who are listening and were like, yeah, I kind of want to learn more about this or maybe I want to implement this into my business uh, would connect with you. What's the best way for our listeners to reach out? Uh, maybe, you know, swap some emails or just connect with you uh, in any way. Yeah, you can, uh, you can email us directly at marketing at artisanroofing.ca um, that that probably be the best way to, to, to bring it down to one email. Brad and I share, uh, we'll, we'll share the information from that email and we're, we're happy to share and walk through this with anyone. Yeah. We actually came away from the summit with uh, a couple of people that were interested that were already lining up some, some calls with them. If you're listening, we, we are getting to you. You're on our mind. Uh, it's, it's been a yeah. whirlwind coming back. Uh, but we're, we're happy to, to walk anyone through. And again, it's, uh, take away from it what you, you feel where you see value. But honestly, if you haven't tried it, uh, so the don't knock it till you've tried it and see if it can apply to your model because we, we really want to help. It's not about competition. Yeah. Uh, even in our own market here, we're happy to share with local contractors and even competition in our roofing niche. We're, we're happy to share. It's, it's not about uh, keeping these cars close to our chest. The, the more we share fearlessly, we can bring the entire industry hopefully to a higher level and uh, eliminate some of the uh, the nonsense that is happening.
Yeah, and that's the key point is that we we need to rise up as an entire industry, and that that's one key focus that I have, uh, you know, as a roofer, is that I, I really want to focus on bringing the whole industry up and sharing this information as a part of that. So well said, boys. It's so well said. I um I really want to thank you guys for your time and your effort on this. Uh, I hope that you guys get uh, you guys kind of bring this this message to the world and this way of doing this to the world. I have a feeling ten years from now this will be very normalized and very very standard, and you can be like, "Hey, we were one of the first people doing that." So uh, thanks for being innovators, and most importantly, like thanks for having the courage to share this. It takes a certain level of confidence and, and and comfort about the world to be like, "Hey, we've created something really genius." Go ahead. We'll show you exactly how to do it, and that's just like very on band, very on brand for for Breakthrough Academy, and that's why uh, we love working with you too. So have an awesome week. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Benji. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Contractor Evolution. If you've already subscribed to our channel, consider sharing this episode with another contractor who you think needs to hear it.